it's Lent. The question that gets bandied around amongst Christians this time of year is, so what are you going to give up? <laughs> well, what's it going to be? Chocolate? Caffeine? Pickled pig's feet? <laughs> Try? I mean, giving up things is what you're supposed to do during Lent, right? Or maybe you've given up on giving up something for Lent. Life's hard enough as it is, right? Why make it more difficult? Well, if that's where you find yourself, you're probably in very good company because um, our society isn't really one that is into denying self. In fact, it's not really much into moderation either. You know, we buy more than we need and we buy a little extra just in case we might run out. We, we buy more clothes than we can wear. We eat whatever we want, whenever we want. But once a year, the church calls us to the observation of a holy Lent, a time of self-denial and personal piety, most often in the form of fasting or prayer or in giving money to those who are in need. And really, it's an opportunity to get off the crazy train for a while and try to get our lives back in line with where we really want them to be all along, which is following the Lord. And Lent is particularly about following Jesus during the 40 days that he spent in the wilderness. Following his baptism, when heaven broke open and the Holy Spirit descended and the voice of God spoke, he was led out into the wilderness for a time of testing and of temptation. And it was a time for him to learn about just who it was he was up against. And he emerged from that time strong and ready to follow God's will for his life the path that God was putting him on. And if we allow Lent to do its work in us, we too will be tempted and tried. And we will come face to face with those things that try to derail us in our own journey. And I can already tell you what you're up against, in general at least. You're up against the world, the flesh, and the devil. As I've already said, the world is telling us that moderation is really so not in. And self-denial, there's no, no room for that whatsoever. It's absurd. Our flesh is telling us that we need things that we really just want. And it's hard for us to, to distinguish between those two. And after those two things have their way with us, the devil really doesn't have much work left, does he? <laughs> but he'll still try. He'll still get a few licks in there. Lynn is about growing strong in our faith and in our walk with the Lord. And one of the best ways to grow stronger is by letting go of things that compete for space and allegiance in our lives. <coughs> the things that we allow to take precedence over God. Now the Old Testament reading that Sue read for us tonight is particularly about fasting. And I have to confess to you, this is not my strength. This is not my spiritual discipline. Um, I have always struggled with it. So I took this opportunity to try to learn more about fasting, and I'm going to try to share with you what I've learned. But before we talk about the different ways to fast, the how-tos and the how-not-tos, it's important to look why we fast at all. And unfortunately, one of the reasons we tend to fast is it gives us a good excuse and an opportunity to give up something that we've really been overindulging in anyway. To stop eating or doing something that we really need to stop what we're doing. And we want to feel better and we want to look better. We want to feel better about ourselves. Or if we're honest, another reason that we fast might be because we want to look better to God. To earn kind of spiritual brownie points. Get them on our side. That's what Isaiah, Isaiah was talking about in the reading from this, from this evening's lesson. In Isaiah 53, the Israelites asked the Lord, why have we fasted? And why have you not, we have fasted and you have not seen it. Why have we humbled ourselves and you not noticed? Aren't you paying attention? Look how good we're being. We're, we're, we're your A-team. <laughs> now at the most innocent end of that scale, we're looking for an attaboy from God. We want him to be proud of us. And at the worst end of that scale, we're looking for a little spiritual leverage to get him on our side. That's all the reasons not to fast. Let's talk about the positive reasons, why we really should fast. And the first is because it's a matter of obedience. Jesus didn't say if you fast, 
he said when he fasted. It's an assumed discipline, and there is plenty of spiritual precedence to back it up. Moses fasted, Abraham fasted, David fasted, Elijah fasted, Daniel fasted. You could go on and on and on. Paul fasted, but the most importantly of all, Jesus himself fasted. Now, some of us, myself included here, can be pretty self-righteous when it comes to some of the spiritual disciplines. Like, well, everybody's supposed to tithe and give. And yet, there are other disciplines where we're not quite so militant, right? And yet, if truth be told, there's probably more in the Bible about fasting than there is about giving. And yet, for many of us, that's kind of been on the back list, the back burner. Well, another reason to fast besides obedience which really ought to be reason enough in itself, is because of what it shows us about ourselves. It reveals to us the things that control us. Paul said in Romans chapter 6, verse 16, don't you realize that you become the slave of whatever it is you choose to obey? And he said in Philippians 3.19, their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. Well, the Lord has recently been showing me that my name is all over both of those verses. And that this has been a particular blind spot in my life, particularly with food for me. And not only is it bad for me physically, it's bad for me spiritually as well. And the same thing could be said about other things. There are lots of things that people struggle about, earthly things that we allow too much space in our lives. Tobacco, alcohol, television, our little cell phones, the computer, all kinds of things. And when we give up something, our bodies and our minds don't like it because they derive pleasure from those things. And so when we give them up, we hear about it, don't we? Our bodies remind us that this is something that they're used to having and that they would like again, thank you very much. So by giving them up, we're able to see a little bit more clearly the hold that we've allowed them to have over our lives. As long as their mouths are full, they're not crying out. It's only when their mouths get empty that we start hearing those voices and seeing a little bit more clearly. You know, there are other types of fasts that we can, we can partake in. We don't necessarily have to give up food. There are other types of fasts that can show us what our spiritual blind spots might be. For instance, fasting from critical or judgmental words or thoughts. That can show us an awful lot about ourselves. 40 days purpose not to say anything critical or think anything critical about someone else. Or you could fast from speaking more than necessary. Use words at a bare minimum. Answer questions, don't be rude, but leave it at that. What that tends to show us is how much we insert ourselves into conversations, how we always seem, seem to somehow bring it back around to us. It shows us how we're so needy of others' <coughs> acceptance and not looking for God's acceptance alone and approval. Another one could be fasting from curse words. It could show, it would remind us that there will be a day when we have to account for every careless word ever spoken. And certainly, I think curse words would fall in that category as careless words. As I, as I said, there's lots of ways to fast besides food. But perhaps the most important reason for fasting at all is so that we can respond to important spiritual needs. And throughout Scripture, in times of crisis, God has called his people to prayer and fasting. Lots and lots of examples. First one that springs to my mind is when the disciples were on their own for a little, little while because Jesus had gone up on the mountain to be transfigured, and a man had brought his son to be delivered from a demon, and they prayed and prayed and prayed, and nothing happened. They couldn't deliver the boy. So the father, in frustration, came to Jesus and said, Can you do something? And of course Jesus could, and he took care of the situation. But later the disciples came to him and said, why couldn't we do that? And Jesus said, well, this type only comes out through prayer and fasting. There was a time in our nation's history when we were called upon to fast and pray. 
1863, President Lincoln designated April the 30th as a day of national humiliation, fasting, and prayer. Let me read just a portion of the proclamation that he issued on this occasion. It is the duty of nations as well as of men who owe their dependence upon the overruling power of God to confess their sins and transgressions, transgressions in humble sorrow, yet with assured hope that genuine repentance will lead to mercy and pardon, and to recognize the sublime truth about announced in the Holy Scriptures and proven by history that those nations only are blessed whose God is the Lord. The awful calamity of civil war which now desolates the land may be but a punishment inflicted upon us for our presumptuous sins to the needful end of our national reformation as a whole people. Intoxicated with unbroken success, we have become too self-sufficient to feel the necessity of redeeming and preserving grace, too proud to pray to the God that made us. We have grown in numbers, wealth, and power as no other nation has grown, but we have forgotten God. <coughs> Those same words could be spoken today, could they not? And the needs are just as great. And we do have a national day of prayer. But perhaps the, the understanding and the call needs to be strengthened that that should be a day of prayer and fasting for all Christians on behalf of our country. <coughs> you see, the voluntary denial of a normal routine activity helps us somehow to be more focused in our prayer. It sharpens us. Because in realizing our dependence upon God, we come to our prayers with a greater sense of urgency and intention. And the sad thing is, if we become unaccustomed to fasting, then in, this, in a time of crisis, when a call for prayer and fasting is made, we won't be ready and, and, and able to take our part. We'll be like soldiers called to battle who have let their weapons fall into disrepair or have failed to practice using them as they should. Now, it bears repeating at this point, fasting is not an attempt at leverage to try to get to God to see things our way or do things that we want him to do. That's not what fasting is about. It's an act of discipline that helps us get in line with what God wants. It opens up the lines of communication so that we can hear from him more clearly. And so the idea behind fasting is not only to show us our weaknesses, but also to help strengthen our faith. We're supposed to take the time that we should be spending in preparing meals or eating them and use that time in prayer. It's not just an extra hour to watch TV or an extra hour to get on the internet. It's the time should be used in prayer. And in fact, the hunger pains that we feel throughout the day of a day that we are fasting can be like calls to prayer. When your stomach starts growling, it should be a reminder, oh yeah, there's a reason I'm not eating. It could also be an opportunity to turn to scripture. Richard Foster wrote in the, his wonderful book, Celebration of Discipline, that fasting reminds us that we are sustained by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Therefore, in experiences of fasting, we are not so much abstaining from food as we are feasting on the word of God. In that sense, fasting is feasting. J.I. Packer offers another interesting take on fasting. He wrote, when friends need to be together, they will cancel all other activities in order to make that possible. There's nothing magical about fasting. It's just one way of telling God that your priority at that moment is to be alone with him, sorting out whatever is necessary, and that you canceled the meal, the party, the concert, whatever it is, whatever you had planned to do, in order to fulfill that important priority in your life. Fasting is about learning self-denial. And that's what Jesus calls us as disciples to do. He said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. It's only in denying ourselves that we are able to quiet those demanding and dictating voices in our lives that compete with God's voice so that we can learn to hear him and follow what he calls us to do. Let's pray. Thank you. That the
the church has this time on the calendar every year for us to focus on this, these important things that help us grow in our faith. Thank you for demanding tasks of us that, did, that require us to give our best efforts. Lord, we ask for your grace in this season of Lent to fulfill the call to prayer and fasting and giving so that we might be in line with your will for us, that we might be strengthened in our faith, and that we might glorify you with our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. offer just a quick word of instruction about what's going to follow in the service. Um, I'm going to issue 